Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Vidusha Natavitharana about institutionalizing collective leadership. Vidusha Natavitarana, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from rural Sri Lanka, and I am south of Salt Lake City in Utah. So we're on different sides of the world and very different time zones. Uh, So it's morning for me, evening for you. uh, And I think we're going to have just a really fun conversation today as we explore this topic of institutionalizing collective leadership within organizations. Uh, I'm really excited to unpack that with you and explore the ins and outs of what that really means and how it could, it could apply to all of us today. As we get started, I wanted to share Vidusha's bio with everybody. Appreciation for his subject matter makes him one of the most sought after leadership trainers and HR consultants in the region. I think that's wonderful. Again, a pleasure to have you. Anything you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? No, I'm, I'm I'm good to dive in. I'm I'm very very um, excited to be here because it's one of those topics that um, I've been exploring for a long long time, and it's wonderful to have this conversation with you. Yeah, well, excellent. Maybe we could start off with just um, a little exploration around current models of leadership. What do you see as maybe missing? Um, what is wrong with or what isn't working in kind of this current approach to leadership that we see in lots of organizations? Sure. So um, I always kind of have this conversation whenever we start leadership programs about what leadership is. Mm. And I ask for a definition because definitions are our way of seeing the world. It's our lens through which we see Mm -hmm. the world. So the moment the definition changes, everything changes, right? So, um, can I digress a little bit because there sure. is a background story to this? So when I was in when I was in grade five, I switched schools um, and I came to Colombo and um, went to a rather um, celebrated school. And I still remember the first term where we had a history lesson, and we had a very famous king who united the country for the first time called King Dutugemno. Now he built this stupa, which still stands to this date after two thousand five hundred plus years. And it's probably one of the biggest monuments in Sri Lanka. And um, it it sounds much better when it says, when it's said in my vernacular Sinhalese in our our language. But it said something, the question read something like, who built and completed Ruan Valley Sire? Now, King Dutukamanu died before the Ruan Valley Sire was actually built and completed. And it was his brother, Saddathissa, King Saddathissa, who completed it. So I wrote on the answer script, it was Saddathis, because there was this nuance to say who completed it, right? And I was marked wrong on this. And I actually went and asked my teacher, why is it marked wrong? And he said, well, didn't you know it's a simple question? King Vutugamna built, you know, Ruan Valley Sahib. And I said, no, sir, but the question reads built and completed. Um, and, and he quite... <laughs> got quite annoyed and told me, well, this ain't the debate society, no, 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 is it a court, courthouse? <laughs> this is wrong. And the answer is, and this got me thinking, right? So ever since that day, I've always wondered, why is it that we always give credence and, and a lot of emphasis on somebody who starts something rather than someone who ends something? And what about everything in between? Because the kings didn't build any of these monuments. I mean, Shah Jahan didn't build 
the Taj Mahal. He he gave owners to it, and he gave obviously he was the king, and therefore he it was his his vision, his his brainchild. Yes, for sure. But there were countless people who got involved in this entire process. So throughout history, I think we've always looked at leadership to be centralized in one person. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan. Right? It's it's one person, and then of course much later on, whether it is um, you, you know Hitler to Churchill to the current presidents, but there is a difference between being a president and being a leader. And I have always looked at leadership as a collective process because, for sure, there's no question in my mind that providing vision is important. But you and I both know that just having a vision doesn't translate it into action. There's a lot that happens in between. And there's a whole group of people that actually combines their skill sets in order to make that vision possible. And when that starts rolling out, especially inside organizations or in, in fact in society in general, you really can't single out one person and turn around and say, that person is the leader. That is the linchpin. That is the pivot. It isn't. So if you imagine this, if you imagine a CEO who is the head of the organization, has a vision, and then communicates this vision, if the rest of the organization doesn't mobilize, nothing comes of it. Yeah. Right? But our central focus, and in fact, our only focus is on that one individual who makes it happen. And I, and I think that's a misnomer. And I think that doesn't stand when you actually scrutinize leadership. So for me, I think the missing link and, 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 and the definitional issue with leadership is that we look at it from a singular focus versus a pluralistic focus. And also very importantly, giving more emphasis for the person right at the top rather than at the bottom of the pyramid. Because by definition, if only the senior level people are supposed to be leaders, everybody else is simply supposed to follow orders. Now, that might have worked um, centuries uh, uh, ago right. when, when you had slaves. Um, and if you barked out orders to a slave, well, obviously the slave doesn't have much of a choice. I don't think that that flies anymore. So if you look at it from that perspective, I think the biggest issue is that historically we've always looked at leadership from an apex power body, distributing it to everybody else and you know giving out orders and everybody else following it through. I think in modern contexts, it is more as a, a collective effort, skill sets coming together, complementary and collaborating in order to make a vision happen. So providing yeah. the vision is important, but at the same time, the different collaborative efforts that happen, both formally and informally, towards making it happen, to me, is leadership. Therefore, by definition, anyone who is involved in that process takes a, a, a role in leadership. Different roles at different levels of the pyramid and in the hierarchy, but leadership nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, I think that is very well said. I think all of us are and should be in, uh, considered as leaders um, in our various roles. We need everyone uh, throughout all layers of an organization, regardless of whatever the hierarchy might look like or the organizational structure might look like, whatever my title and role might be, you know, everyone has leadership capabilities and responsibilities. If you hope, if you have a hope of the organization being successful and being relevant in the marketplace and innovative and all of that, then you need, um, you need the best from everybody and you need leadership from everybody. And, and frankly, when I see quote unquote leaders, the people with the titles, the people with the hierarchical positions. When I see leaders who treat it as though it's a consolidation of power, they have power, they have control, it's about them, they're ego driven, etc. Those aren't leaders. Like though they're like the worst leaders oftentimes, um, because they're not actually galvanizing the collective um power and influence of their teams. Uh, because of the way they approach their people. And oftentimes they're condescending, they talk down to, they bark orders, like you said, they they make edicts and they they require things without having good dialogue and 
trying to really understand where people are coming from, all of that's going to be really, really important. Are there other aspects of collective leadership that you feel are, are really essential in the modern world of work, the modern um, societal environment that we find ourselves? So let me kind of answer that question in three small different ways. I think if you really look at it, and you touched on a very important point, and I want to kind of make a segue to that because I think lots of people misunderstand it. Um, you're absolutely right. Ultimately, leadership at some point translates into power, whichever way you look at it. And and, and lots of people have a love-hate relationship with power, isn't it? Uh, some people see it as all there is, uh, and some people kind of look at it as, well, if you're a leader, you shouldn't use power. You should only use influence. Um, I, I kind of sit in the middle of that equation. I've always felt that there is a place for power. No question about it. Let me give you a quick example of this. Imagine an organization in crisis. Very quick decisions need to be made. You really don't have the time to discuss, debate, and, and, and get the collective um, group going in a conversation. In moments like this, it is perfectly acceptable to exercise authority and power. Mm -hmm. Bark out the orders, expect everyone to follow through. The issue is that people who do that do only that. Right. The flip side of it is that people who kind of expect leaders to be engaged, to get everyone's opinion and perspective, focus only on that. I think both are required. So having said that, um, let me kind of give a, a nuance to collective leadership in three or four different dimensions. The first is, I honestly think collective leadership happens in every single organization. In fact, even in families, there yep. is an informal power play, informal networks, um, informal gatherings, decisions get made over a cup of coffee or, or, or a beer in the evening, as much as in the boardroom. So I think that collective aspect of it is there, even though we don't probably give a lot of credence to it. That's one aspect. There's another aspect where we consciously build leadership teams, um, the most common being the CEO and the C CXOs. That's one group which collectively runs an organization. But at the lower levels also, when special projects come in, it's quite common to, to have a collective group coming together, brainstorming ideas, coming up with a project, and then disseminating afterwards. That's another aspect of it. And of course, don't forget that there is um, the, the unwritten um, uh, people who are influencers mm -hmm. into decision-making. They don't have any formal power. And I, and I often joke about yeah. the fact that if, you, if you're married with kids, um, I always joke about the fact that it's not the mom or the dad who runs the household. It's the kids who run the household. We <laughs> eat what they like to eat. We go on holidays when they have holidays and we wait until they go to sleep for us to watch TV, you know? Um, so, 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 so we, we quite literally run their timetable, um, even though we are supposed to be the ones who are in charge in, in, in introspect, they actually call the shots and we follow through. Um, and inside the organizations, it's no different. Sometimes you have very junior level people who have a large sway with decision makers. That too is the collective effort, um, a very informal um, one at like that. So all of these dimensions are there in leadership when we look at the practical aspects of leadership. Unfortunately, this doesn't quite reflect in how we teach leadership. Um, nor is it reflected in most of the literature either. We almost always look at an individual and say, these are the characteristics or these are the blueprints that you need to follow in, in order for you to be a leader. But we do need to look at it from a much more dynamic perspective. I think leadership is a dynamic process. It's not, it's not a set of guidelines or a set of rules or a set of competencies or even a set of behaviors. It's an amalgamation of all of, all of that juxtaposed with the love-hate relationship with power. I don't yeah. think you can actually turn around and say leadership is only about influence. Um, I don't think you can say it's only about power either. I think there is a dynamic interplay between these two. 
Yeah, I know yeah, it's well a lot, said. but that's how I that that's my complicated way of looking at leadership. No, I think that's super helpful. So if if we're buying into this idea that collective leadership is going to be more powerful, produce better outcomes for you know ourselves and our careers, but our team, our organization, you know, we can br- bring value to the market, be relevant, etc. How do we go about institutionalizing it? How how do we embed it? How do we create systems in our organization so that can be a part of what the DNA of the organization is? In answering that, let me again make a quick detour. The first is to acknowledge the fact that we have collective leadership, even though we don't might might not necessarily see it that way. Um, um, even in a typical absolute hierarchy, we have dimensions of collective leadership. Sometimes there is emergent power bases that takes place inside the most rigid of hierarchical organizations. So I do want to kind of anyone who is exploring collective leadership, especially to institutionalize it, is to first acknowledge the fact that even though you might not look at it that way, it does exist. So let's start there. I think every organization has a certain level of collective leadership embedded in them. As as long as there's an organization, there's internal politics, there are informal networks, um, there are power dynamics, all of this exists. So it, it exists to begin with. But if you want to institutionalize it from a structured approach to making leadership more collective, I think three things are critical. The first is what I would call uh, ecosystems, right? Ecosystems include things like um, HR policies and procedures, right? Um, Systems and governance protocols, which needs to emphasize how people make decisions how people promote leaders into the higher levels of the organization. And it's essential, absolutely essential, that you spot people not only for their performance, but also for living values, as well as being able to have two very, very important characteristics. The first is you need to be self-assured. I've Mm -hmm. often found the biggest problem with as you said, quote unquote, leaders, is that they're insecure. And if you have insecure leaders, it's it's catastrophic. um, Can I I just comment on that real quick? So I I completely agree. So a lot of times when you see these ego-driven, power consolidating, controlling types of leaders, there's a lot of bluster and they they act all confident. Um, But I think at the foundation of all of that is an immense amount of insecurity. Um, in immaturity. And and so I think that's really important to recognize when when you can be the type of leader that's focused not on yourself, but on the people around you and developing and building up the people around you and including them in the process, that that by its very nature is just a much more self-assured, reassured, mature kind of an approach to how you're going to try to tackle any of the types of issues that organizations and teams have to face. Oh, absolutely. So one is being self-assured or, 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 or being, um, you know, self-assured and, and, and being able to be comfortable in your own skin and, and be confident in who you are truly at, at your very core. The second is a bit paradoxical when I say it, and lots of people question me on this, uh, feel free to do so, but there, there needs to be a, a paradox. The first is you need to be absolutely driven. Um, but at the same time, you need to temper it with making it not about you, but about yeah. the organization. I think that's really important. You cannot be a leader without being driven. I, I think you do need to have ambition, but not ambition for the sake of your ego, but for the sake of the organization as a whole, so that you drive results through people rather than at the cost of people. Yes. No, I completely agree with that. Um it's it's a slightly different way of framing it than I've heard some other people um, describe it, but I completely agree that uh, again, if we're, if we're making it about ourselves and we're making it about how you know we have all these these accolades because we're a great leader, um, that is simply not going to be as powerful as when we uh, create an environment where everyone can do great work and we provide the support mechanisms for that to happen. Um, I can be an incredibly driven person in both cases, 
Um, but the 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 case of the ego driven leader, it, it's all about them. And so if if I'm a driven person, uh, I'm someone who likes to achieve. I'm someone who likes to accomplish things. But my focus on achievement is recognizing the focus on my team and developing them and helping them. Um, it's just so much more powerful. And frankly, you're going to look better as a leader too. So, I mean, you're going to get more done. Your team's going to accomplish more. It's going to accomplish better stuff and, and innovate more and all those sorts of things. So you're just going to look brilliant as a leader when you do it that way. Um, but you do need people who are are willing to put in the effort and the work behind that kind of leadership, because it does take more sustained, consistent effort um, to lead in that way. Absolutely. And, and again, I think, um, so the first aspect of it, like I mentioned, was creating that ecosystem, right? So again, the issue is that we rely far too much on an individual to have these characteristics, rather than having an organizational ecosystem that supports and foster it. Imagine that not being the onus of the individual, but of the organizational ecosystem yeah. and being able to ensure that you you build in the architecture, especially for career progression, where you identify people who are that. And, and, and if you're not that, imagine your organization having conversations with you to say, Vidusha, you're a wonderful performer, but I want you to improve on one, two, three, four, five. Now, the moment that happens, I often tell people that we propagate what we celebrate. And that's, that, that honestly is true. Um, so if we propagate the right values, everything else falls into play. But for that, you need to celebrate the kind of people who live the values versus yeah. the people only th that, that which performs. So that's the first part. That's, that's creating the ecosystems. The second is something that you already touched on, which is you need people to consistently and consciously build in time to grow more leaders. Mm -hmm. That's essential because see, we, it's one thing to talk about this philosophically, right? But, but the bottom line is we all get sucked into work and we are held accountable and responsible for results. The issue, unfortunately, is most of the time organizations might have very strict guidelines on what meetings you have, uh, the KPIs you need to achieve, and so on and so forth. But I've seen very few organizations who put in the same amount of effort and time into creating learning systems or learning organizations that systematically grows leaders at every level. Yeah. That is critical. So, and, and I'm not talking of just simply doing training programs on leadership, even though I am a leadership trainer. I often turn around and tell people leadership training doesn't work um, <laughs> simply because, you know, it doesn't, it really doesn't because it's only one part of the solution. Right. Um, right. It's a bit like a kid going to school. I often tell uh, people, think about parents. You can choose the best school for your kid. But as a parent, if you think your responsibility stops simply because you put the kid to school, uh, it's not going to work. You have to come back home, take a look at the books. Now, some kids instinctively um, want to learn, right? But but that's the minority, right? Most of us would like to dodge school as much as possible. Um, so, <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I, I often joke about this. I kid you not. I have a daughter who's now 21 years old. Um, she was born prematurely, so she spent some time um, in a in an incubator, and 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 I often joke about the fact. I wonder whether my daughter actually got switched at birth, because <laughs> no, here she was, here she was, waking up every morning, um, ready to go to school. She's packed the bag the night before. She's packed her sandwiches. She's brought her bottle. She's at the doorstep fifteen minutes before we leave, and literally saying. Can we go now? Can we go now? Can we go now? Can we go now? And she'll wake up on Saturday and actually be glum about the fact that she's not going to school. And I told my wife, this can't be my kid. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, so that's the minority, right? So yeah. inside organizations, you do need to put a conscious effort to build leadership capability by coaching, by mentoring, by successive training programs, by giving youngsters an opportunity to lead initiatives and so on and so forth. That's the second part. The third part is this, and, and this is when I become very unpopular for saying this. Not everyone's cut out to do this. 
right? Everyone has the potential to do it. I agree. But not everyone has the capacity to lead and the willingness to lead mm -hmm. and the willingness to let go of your ego and leave it behind at some point in your career saying, this is enough about me. Let me now focus on somebody else. And at a certain level of seniority, if they cannot leave their ego behind and move forward, the organization must be bold enough to remove you because it is yeah. counterproductive and it is actually the, the most detrimental thing to collective leadership that I can think of. So as long as you have ecosystems that um, encourage this, if you have a learning organization that promotes leadership capacity and capability building across the tiers, and if you have a removal process of counterproductive leaders, I think collective leadership flourishes. Yeah, well said. Vidusha, this has just been a really great conversation. I know at the time, I need to let you go here in just a minute. But before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you and find out more about your work. And then give us a final word on the topic for today. For sure. Thank you. Um, so um, connecting with me, I, I, I think I'm not too much of a social media person. The only only social media platform I'm kind of uh, on is LinkedIn. Um, so Vidush Shanata Vitaran on LinkedIn um, would be my handle. Apart from that, well, uh, Vidush at highfiveconsultancy.com is my email address if anyone wants to reach out. Uh, I, I think those two probably would be the best modes of communication with me. And a final word, well, um, I, I leave you with this. I'm, I'm one of those people who have always believed that at some point in, in, in human beings' evolution, I, I think we do need, um, before anything else, I, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that we are a human being first mm. and if everything else second. Caste, creed, religion, um, rank, um, status, whatever. Um, and I think that if you can manage to bring about, I think collective leadership is easy. The moment you put anything else above humanity, I think that's when the problem happens. So I think all of the effort that we need to put in, both from a schooling perspective as well as a leadership perspective, needs to bring that to the fore. And I think it is about time, especially now, whilst we are having this conversation, I think there are plenty of examples where that is not the case and, and, and the ill that it brings. So I think that I think would be a great starting point. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Thank you so much. It's just been a real pleasure. This has been a super fun conversation. There's a lot more that can be said. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, and find out more about what Vidusha can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.